Welcome to ASM Live from the 2014 American Society for Microbiology meeting in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Stanley Malloy. I'm your host today. We're going to have a conversation about a lot of things that relate to microbiology. Sometimes we talk about things that are important, sometimes interesting, and sometimes downright surprising. And today we have as our guest Christian Jobin from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And we're going to be talking about microbes and cancer. Uh, this is a, a very interesting topic. You know, bef before we start talking about this, it reminds me of this quote that has always been attributed to the Surgeon General William Stewart, which he claims is incorrect. Uh, when people around the 1960s, when infectious diseases were decreasing in incidence, and he said, we need to close the book on infectious diseases and begin fighting chronic diseases like cancer and heart disease. Hmm. And microbiology funds plummeted. And, and, and now we see that there is this connection a link. Yeah, absolutely. between microbiology and cancer. Right, right. right. No, I mean, just, just to uh, make things clear, University of Florida, I should have said that, uh, hmm. It's not your fault. I mean, the, the book, the book had to be wrong. So University of Florida, but yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, we, I mean, the age of of associative disease with microbes, infectious disease. I mean, with decades and decades and decades of work, and uh, and infectious disease is one aspect of 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 the of the link between bacteria and cancer. But what we're doing, at least me and other people, is the non-infectious, the one that we have in our gut and different uh, uh, location uh, uh, cavities in our bodies that are there most of the time uh, behaving normally. But some of them may change their behavior because either a dietary um, habit, and lifestyles, or, or genetics of the host, and these turn into your enemy within. So two, 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 two type of ideas, infectious microorganism entering an ecosystem and causing disease, and a gut or, or a different biome within yourself that changed a behavior over time. So. So, so this is the connection between the microbiota and inflammation and then subsequent chronic disease. Absolutely, yeah. So these microbes will change their, uh, their behavior. I like to link this to, uh, you know, you got a baby, it's beautiful, uh, lovely, nice pictures, and then they turn into teenagers. Huh? The teenage years, they are not the same anymore. <laughs> they, they are a little bit rowdy, a little bit misbehave, and this is a challenging time. And the bugs will change their face, will change their, uh, their behavior, and we don't, need, we don't control, we don't understand where is the switch, where do we change the behavior that are causative of cancer, and could we prevent that? I mean, th this is what we're trying to do understand how they change, what make them change their behavior, and can we do anything about that? Can you give us an example of a, a, one, a strong correlation between these two causation and final event? Right, so if we talk about the microbiome studies, which is basically a uh, large-scale sequencing, uh, because in the gut we don't have all the condition to culture these microorganisms. It will come, but we don't have it yet. So the, the easiest way is just to sequence all the, uh, let's say, if you want to f identify your microbes, you sequence the 16S ribosomal gene, and you could uh, 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 assign them to class and phylums and so on. So by sequencing, there were a strong association, for example, in colorectal cancer. This is where the field is more mature. Other type of cancer, we're not quite there, but let's take colorectal cancer. So there is associative uh, studies for Fusobacteria, uh, which is a regular member of our gut. Uh, there is associative uh, uh, studies with uh, Salmonella, and, I'm sorry, Shigella and E. coli that are a member of our, of our gut. So these bugs associated with disease and, and people have shown causative, uh, uh, not just associative, but causative when they go to animal model and use clinical isolate from these patients with colorectal cancer, for example. You put it in the mouse, and you have cancer. Uh, so now you're quite 
try to understand the mechanism leading to that. So the, those are, the, the field is mature, a little bit more mature for Fusobacterium, uh, Escherichia coli, we have data for that. We kind of understand a little bit the mechanism, but it's still a, you know, a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So th those are, those are, are examples, you know, uh, bacteria fragilis, ATBF mm -hmm. has been linked as well, and, and there is data for animal models. So we, we, we kind of get to, to, to the proof of principle that bugs, some commensal bugs could give cancer. The question is, are they working all together? Are they polymicrobial? You know, it's not one guy leading to cancer, it's likely a bunch of guys interacting to each other. And what are the cues that make them turn into a, a bug that has cancer, cancer potential? So, so how do you do the transfer to mice? Are those germ-free mice that you're moving into? Or? Right, there's different ways. I mean, if you have a clinical isolate, so you have a tissue from a cancer patient and, and, and off-site tumor tissue, and uh, you grow them, there's, there's ways, if you identify a bug by sequencing and you say, hey, I think it's a fusobacterium, you devise a culture system to, to pull them off of the tissue, you culture them and uh, characterize, make sure they are the bug that you think they are, and then, and then you put them in a different model different model of cancer. They could be a germ-free mouse. So if you do a germ-free mouse, uh, you, that will allow you to do one bug and then say, hey, that bug alone can cause cancer or fail to cause cancer. So I need other people in that mix. So it's a great answer, but we are not people with one bug. <laughs> There's many bugs. So you could do a transfer to, uh, or use a, a mouse as is, uh, birth at birth colonized with bugs and then introduce your bug of interest into that mix. But sometimes it's difficult to introduce, force a niche in a, in a, in a set of an ecosystem that is already uh, established. So people use antibiotics to trick the system. So they wipe out the bugs and then they come with their bugs. So it's no, there's nothing really physiological about that. So that's why we, uh, you know, I don't think someone is, is waving the flag of, I found a bug that caused cancer yet. It's just observation that, that are tantalizing and, and, and of importance enough to, to keep going with the research. Right. So, so a key possibility is that it's not the bug per se, it's the stimulation of inflammation. Is right. that correct? No, an environment. So the people have shown that diet, uh, lifestyles, uh, you know, environment will be, uh, you know, antibiotics treatment or inflammation. A, a long chronic exposure to inflammation or a long chronic exposure to antibiotics change your microbiome. Now, is the change of this microbiome leading you to uh, diseases? We know that obesity is linked to, uh, you know, may be linked to chronic use of, of antibiotics and, uh, and the microbes are very important to that. And probably the same, maybe the same thing with cancer. So uh, experiencing inflammation uh, on a chronic stage like uh, inflammatory bowel disease patient, it is a big change in the environment and a big change in the microbes. And uh, that would be one example. But you know, we have, you know, this is the data we need, but there is different uh, exposure to environment that may be uh, important for us, a, a diet that is, you know, the Western type diet, the fast food diet. Um, and we know that there is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the obesity linked to cancer. So there is a lot of things about microbes and all this environment uh, exposure we have, our lifestyles that are likely to be changing microbial activity whether it's cancer, whether it's inflammation, whether it's, it's obesity and different things. So before we continue, I want to remind our studio audience, if you have any questions, please join the conversation at the microphone on the side. And if you're listening in online, please send questions via Twitter at hashtag ASM2014. So in at least a few of these cases now, you have a pretty strong association. Right. Is it strong enough to be predictive? Well, yeah, so the power of microbiome is that if you do the sequencing, we were doing microbial uh, genomic, you know, the sequence of the genome in, in the hope of identifying genes that could be uh, predictive of diseases so you could have biomarkers. And the conversation shifted from the genome, the mammalian genome, which is 25,000 uh, genes, 
up uh, down to the microbiome, which is three million genes, and then, hey, maybe we could screen genomes of microbes and use that as, an, as, a, as a marker of disease. And, and there's manuscript papers that, uh, that, that is out there exactly doing that. Microbial genes, predictive of, of cancer, and, uh, and that would be one aspect. Uh, but obviously, the, the one thing that, the fascinating thing about microbiome, could you identify a microbiome that is associated with cancer, and then you come with, here's how I would like you to, to shape your microbiome. I want you to have this microbiome that is a little bit more healthy. Let's go this way, and I give you that. We're missing that component. You know, people think it could be probiotics, uh, healthy bugs, and uh, whether or not it's true and feasible to do that, the data are not clear, uh, or maybe it's a change, a different prebiotics, a different diet, changing your microbiome into, into the, good, the, good, the good biome. So we're lacking ex a clear picture of what is a bad biome. You go to your doctor, take a look at your microbes, you said, my son, you have, you have a high risk uh, with this biome to develop that type of disease. Let me give you this. So uh, th there will be fantasy land, uh, but I think we're working toward that. That's great. Yeah. We have a question from the audience. Yes, one question. With, <clears throat> there's a lot of work being done at the Loma Linda Medical Center right now in, in California, and they're looking long-term at those individuals who are vegetarians, right. specifically vegetarians, and so if vegans to that extent. Is there a difference in their microbiome that you could actually identify which organisms are pr present or absent within these two groups or, yes, well, three groups really, because right. there's a lot to be said about being a vegan versus a vegetarian versus a normal, what we call the American diet. No, no this, is, this is great. I mean, actually, uh, if you have a vegan lifestyle diet, there is changes in your microbiome. But the, the real question is, is, we know there will be changes in different con conditions. Either it's, a, it's an extreme diet, you know, high fat diet, or mm -hmm. at the other, other end of the extreme, uh, a vegan diet. The question is, 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 yes, they change, but is this change beneficial for you? And is a vegan person uh, immune of cancer? Uh, you know, and, and, and which kind of microbes of the time will protect you from, if we're talking about cancer, okay. uh, you know, uh, cancer development? We don't have an idea about that because we, we're missing a lot of information. But yes, a vegan diet will have you with a different set of microbes, maybe not so pronounced about uh, the identity of the, of, the, of, the, of the microbes, but the function of them, because they will function according to the environment. You know, oh, I have less and less of these uh, high fat protein and complex sugar things, and, and, and I don't need that type of genes, expression and activities, and I'm shifting toward that because okay. my environment is composed of different type of nutrients. So there will be a change in activities, but we don't know if these activities are really protective. Okay, this, this is a follow-up question. So you're not just looking at one specific type of cancer or location of cancer, it's just cancer in general within the body. Because with the vegan diets and the vegetarian diets versus right. the American diet, <clears throat> excuse me, they're looking, they were looking specifically at colon cancer, okay. so that was a specific focus. Okay. Uh, and thinking of all the organisms that we have in our microbiome right. in the intestines, I just thought that possibly we could identify, be e well, easier <laughs> to identify the presence or absence of one or two that may be a major, major right. contributor to one or the other. <clears throat> no, no, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That, yeah. the, the, these these studies will. Uh, you know, are important if we okay. could link a, a diet to a protective effect on cancer and then link that to a specific microbial activity and extract this activity out yeah. Yeah. of that, of that, of that, you know, ecosystem and, and, and brand this as your next protective microbes. That would be fantastic. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. So, Christian, tied into this question, one thing you can look at is diet, but there are also real strong ethnic disparities associated with cancer, including colon cancer. Right. And I, I wonder if the, the changes in the predictive or, organisms reflect those cancer disparities mm. as well. Wow. 
Well, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, component to this question. I mean, yeah, disparity in, in cancer could be because lower access to healthcare and screening, uh, whether or not it's linked to microbes. I mean, we know that the genome or the makeup, uh, you know, uh, is important uh, for, for microbial control and host response. So whether or not we, we could screen them with, uh, you know, uh, race and ethnicity, uh, I think we don't have that. There is a lot of microbiome studies in different geographical you know, location, and we know that they are different. If your lifestyle is, is more relaxed in the jungle, <laughs> having a very uh, low pace of uh, lifestyle versus uh, New York style craziness, uh, <laughs> it, may be, it may be a lot of differences there. Jungle might be pretty hard too. <laughs> well, no, I mean, if you have your coconut and everything is fine, maybe. <laughs> if you don't have to hunt too much. But no, I mean, the idea is there is, there is differences uh, in, 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 in the environment where you, you, you live. So, you, and it will reflect on some microbial uh, position and activities, uh, could we link that to, to a protective? So if, if, a, if an ethnicity is more protected from cancer or more prevalent for cancer, is this, is the, is this protection of prevalence incidence linked to, to microbes? So this is, there's a lot of these studies cooking uh, right now, so we don't, we don't, it's tantalizing to think yes, uh, but we don't have the, uh, the, the answer at this point. So there's, an, when you look at the microbiome as a whole, we kind of disaggregate a lot of distance in the human gut. But um, typically, a, the initial cancer lesion will be at a particular site. And, right. and I wonder if, if there's a way of correlating the organisms that are most closely associated with this with certain foci within the gut. You, do you have a clue about that yet? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was an experiment that we wanted to do, actually. That was the first experiment that we set up in the lab to show that a bug will cause inflammation in that region of the gut, and it will superimpose with the cancer. And the experiment we did is two different bugs. One will be more of a proximal inflammation, and one will be a distal kind of inflammation. And then I look, where is the cancer? And, and the outcome was totally different. The outcome was oh, that bug that caused inflammation was not producing or promoting cancer. And the other one, which the same capacity to induce uh, inflammation, uh, but at a different location, was giving cancer. So this experiment was a failure in terms of superimposing the, the site of inflammation with the, with the origin of cancer, but gave us the idea that the bugs, the nature of the bugs, and the capacity to induce cancer is different within bugs. But there is a, comp there is a publication lately that you know, link a microbial composition or geographical uh, niche to cancer. So in this, in this uh, experiment, they use a, a mouse that is uh, uh, overexpressing the AGFR receptor activation. So it's a, throughout the colon. But what they found is that only in the cecum there was serrated uh, polyps, which is very relevant to human cancer. Uh, these bugs were right there in the cecum and were giving the cancer. So that was a geographical link between location of, of bugs and, and the origin of cancer. But that's one of the very few papers that did that. So in, in this case, in that mouse, they're hyperinflammatory throughout the gut? Is that the uh, it's, not, it's not an inflammatory uh, uh, per se model. It's more a, a spontaneous uh, cancer model somehow, but the cancer was prevalent uh, where the bugs were found. Uh, and, and the bugs were not found. It's not like a specific bugs. It was more of a at a, at a, at a family level type, so we don't know exactly the, the identity of these bugs, and will they cause cancer if you transfer them to another mouse? So they have not answered that question yet, but the, the superimposition of a, a bug location with the cancer was, was uh, the, the prime observation of that study. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that would be important. In our case, if a bug is producing a toxin that damages DNA, you will think that where the bug is and releasing this toxin, this is where you're going to see cancer. But we don't, we don't have this information yet. Yeah. Now, so the concept is, bug does something funky, inflammation happens, 
long-term inflammation mm -hmm. ultimately stimulates cancer, right? So that, that's the other aspect of this, long-term inflammation. Right. But is it particular aspects of inflammation? Can we dissect that out yet? I mean, there are many ways you can stimulate an inflammatory response, right. and, and they're right. unique. No, I mean, in terms of inflammation, uh, IBD, I mean, the cytokines have been worked out pretty well. I mean, we have TNF, interferon gamma, L23, uh, L17A, so a lot of cocktail of, of cytokines. But in, in the particular model we're using in my lab, uh, all these cytokines were induced uh, by uh, these two bugs we were working, but only one bug was able to induce the cancer. Mm -hmm. So even though the inflammatory component of the host and all the cocktail of cytokines were right there in the tissue, they were not promoting cancer uh, with that particular bug, uh, but, the, uh, but with the other bug it was, and, and that's how we found this genotoxin uh, colibactin that was necessary to push the system forward. That was just an example, but, but yes, there is cytokines, maybe a bug like uh, ETBF, uh, the enterotoxin uh, B fragilis, that is producing a toxin, and it's signaling through the STAT3, blah, 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 IL-17, and that promotes cancer. So there is link between microbial uh, activities, toxin, with a specific immune response and a promotion of cancer. If you delete or stop the cytokine production, then you decrease cancer. Uh, but it's not all, all the bugs do it, they do it the different way. So that's why it's so challenging. You know, if you have that type of bug, they will use this mechanism, therefore you will have to prevent it that way. Another bug may be different. So it's personalized almost medicine. If someone will have to have a map of bugs and you say, if we have all the info on them, oh, mister, we have that type of bugs, and they go through that pathways. I give you this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so personalization of the intervention based on your make makeup, microbial makeup, and that, that, that's pretty powerful. Right. We're not there yet. But it, it, so if you understand a list of these genotoxins, then potentially, in addition to modulating this process by changing the microbial flora, Mm -hmm. You could develop specific inhibitors of those toxins right. that would... Oh, absolutely. I mean, if I, had, uh, if I have a penny for every phone call I got from companies, so they want, they, they're targeting uh, the microbiome, mining the microbiome exactly for toxin or, or factors that they could, uh, with small molecule inhibitors, goes after. So in our case and of our toxin, you know, it's found in, in patients with colorectal cancer. And therefore, one could say, if you have this... Uh, through your microbiome screen, I, have a, I, I see that you have this bug, and uh, we could give you this, this, this inhibitor during the treatment, you know, or something like that. So there's small molecule inhibitor of, of microbial toxin and, and, and all different factors that you will think could come on the market. Uh, I mean, we're talking decades here, but that will be the idea. Mm -hmm. That will be the idea. And, and do you see the changes with precancerous lesions prior to the actual availability of cancer? I know that's a harder sample to get in humans. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, we were not able to do that, no, no, because, yeah, that's very difficult, yeah. Okay. We have a question from our audience. Hi. Uh, so you, you just talk about, so like, how uh, the microbiome composition or the presence of a certain species in the microbiome may contribute to the development of cancer. Uh, I'm, also, I'm thinking about another example, like uh, in, in some cases, you know, like uh, uh, people have identified uh, uh, the specific human genes associated with uh, cancers, for example, like uh, breast cancers. So if you already carry that, uh, those genes uh, on your genomes, do you think uh, like uh, the microbiome uh, can play any roles in that situation to help maybe reduce the risk of developing uh, those kind of cancers? Uh, do you have any comments or thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I certainly don't want to deny the, the, uh, the importance of a genetic uh, alteration that predisposes to cancer. Uh, but we know that the genetics of colorectal cancer is not sufficient to explain the, the incidence. So it's probably, in our case, we need the bugs itself. You give it to a mouse that has no predisposition. So all the genes are functional. It will not cause cancer. So you have to have a predisposition. 
So the human or the mouse uh, uh, genome has to be altered or predisposed to cancer through either a genetically engineered mouse, an APC min mouse, or a procarcinogenic compound you give just to initiate, and then you come with the bug. So you will think that the same with human. I mean, you have to have the perfect storm coming, which will be a predisposition, whether or not it's in, in inherited or, or sporadically, and then, and then unluckily, a, a biome that is, that is uh, fostering genotoxic activities. So both of them collide to, to increase your incidence of cancer. Because I'm also thinking, like, uh, if the presence of that, of those uh, cancer genes, right. have some kind of effect on the microbiome composition, we don't or know. it's vice versa. No, no. I mean, it's quite valid. Some of these genes uh, may be important in in, in keeping a uh, let's say, if we're talking about colorectal cancer, an epithelium that is protective of bugs. So, and we know from the the, the mouse model that an APC min mouse has a very leaky gut with a decreased expression of some of the tight junction that keep the epithelial cells tight. So if you have a loose epithelium because of the genetic predisposition on the host, and then you have microbes that come, so that's the perfect storm I'm talking about. So it's coming here. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Given the increase of incidence that we're seeing in a lot of these cancers, I think it seems clear the perfect storms seem to be increasing on the horizon. Well, I mean, yeah, exactly, yeah. You can't explain by genetics if you have an increased incidence. Uh, you know, the, the, the health, uh, you know, the screening and so on will, 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 will be uh, improving and people will comply better, but I mean, the, the incidence is, is, can't be uh, explained. This is the same with inflammatory bowel disease. Bowel disease can be explained by genetics. Right. But this, this comes back to an earlier question we had today, but also the whole concept of the war on cancer, and that cancer is a whole slew of, of different things. And there may be cases where the microbiome in the gut is really important. And in the case of the stomach, we know that Helicobacter pylori is the guy that plays the right. role there. And, and there, there may be a lot of other examples, and there may be some that have nothing to do with the microbiome, although I hate to imagine such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of business. <laughs> anyway, the, yeah. we're about ready to call it, it quits for the day. We really, okay. It was great talking with you. I think this really stimulates a lot of thought about new ways to think about how we can respond to cancer. As you said, it's a long ways off, but if we can dissect these things, instead of treating cancer after it happens, right. we may be able to, in fact, prevent it from happening. And that's a very exciting thing to imagine. Absolutely. So it's been wonderful talking with you. Our guest today has been Christian Jobin. He is at the University of Florida. <laughs> and I'm your host, Stanley Malloy. Thank you so much for joining us on ASM Live. Thank you. Explore the fundamental role of microbes in the natural history of our planet with Microbes in Evolution, the world that Darwin never saw. Available at eStore.asm.org.